Ladies and gentlemen, this is the J. Hebert Podcast Production. Yes! We talk about the good. I am the best on this microphone, in that ring, even in commentary. Wrestling runs in cycles. You see, they have down periods, and then they have something they call the boom periods. The bad. In a couple of years, we're going to be the top guys. And you won't have to worry about some of these dumb ideas that they come up with, and I was wrong. And the ugly. I haven't flipped out this bad since my mom canceled my subscription to Warcraft. Then where, oh where, are my WWE ice cream bars? Shut the hell up! Do you know who I am? I'm Bully Ray. I'm destined for greatness. This is where the big boys play, huh? You were either in or you were either out, brother. You either believed or you didn't, man. And you were either ready or you weren't. You have to pay, man. We be wildin' on the corner stupid. freestyling It's, it's just watching them do it Bunch. Realize it's all real Nod your head on the regular Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first ever installment of the Jay Hebert side of things. This is your host, of course, Jay Hebert. And what you just heard was a uh, collage of some of my favorite promos of all time when it comes to uh, the world of wrestling, whether it be in TNA, whether it be in WWE, um, WCW, the whole nine. Um, it's, you know, it, it's, it's been a while since I've been on here, you know, um, and the reason why I'm doing a solo podcast right now is really because, um, my friend Mike, of course, as you all know, uh, for anybody who listened to the Generation of Wrestling Scoop has, uh, kind of come to a halt again. Uh, the reason why is he, he just simply can't do it, and I do have, uh, free time a lot. Uh, when it comes to my day, and, or really my week. I mean, this could be sporadic, you know? I could I could come up with topics off, off of my brain, and I could just share it with you guys, and I figured I'd do one on YouTube, since I figured out how to do more than just, you know, 15-minute uh, clips on here. So I figured I might as well do that from this point on. Um, and I'm going to start with, you know, a topic where I feel like I should have started with a while ago, especially on the uh, podcast itself, uh, when it came to the Generation of Wrestling Scoop. Some of the most underrated wrestlers of all time. And I got this idea uh, from Aaron Reft of uh, No DQ CAW. He did a, uh, he did a poll uh, of what fans thought of some underrated wrestlers. And if people care about my opinion, I want to kind of go over what I think are wrestlers that were underrated or underutilized, um, whether it be not just and, and this is going to be like a big list. Like these is and I don't even need a list in my hand. This is off the top of my head, and these could be from ECW, WCW, WWE, WWF, or whatever you want to call it back then. Um, it could be from TNA, Ring of Honor, um, New Japan, um, maybe AAA. You know, it, it could be from the whole nine. So, we're going to go through it, and we're going to go through the list uh, that, you know, whatever comes out of my head. Um, one of the first people that comes to mind when it comes to underrated talent or underutilized talent would be Shelton Benjamin from his WWE days. And you can even say the same thing in Ring of Honor when they brought him in, especially if they, you know, were going to make Charlie Haas a single star and not Shelton Benjamin. Um, and, and this guy has all the tools. I mean, this guy has everything about him. The only thing he doesn't really have is the mic skills. But I, I feel like that shouldn't matter with him. This guy is larger than life just because of the stuff he's done and money in the bank. Just because of, uh, just because of numerous other things. I mean, this guy is one of the most athletically gifted superstars that has ever walked into WWE and in the Ring of Honor. This guy is awesome. This guy should be should have been pushed in WWE more. I mean, you wonder why he left is because he never got the push that he deserved ever. And, and and he did all those stunts in Money in the Banks. All those great matches with the HBK. You know, all those amazing matches and amazing feuds with Chavo Guerrero for nothing. You know, you wonder why he left. You know, the, the guy had a great feud with MVP. I mean, this guy was doing great stuff. And and they just kept dropping the ball with him every single time. I mean, 
If anything, he should have gotten a world heavyweight title. I mean, the, the guy didn't even get the world heavyweight. The, this guy had everything, everything that you want in an athlete. But, of course, WWE looks at the entertainment side of things, and I guess he's dull on the mic. I don't think people really care. And and that's the thing I noticed. I don't think people care when he talks. And, and I love how... I love how people say that about Shelton Benjamin. A legit badass in the ring. When he is running up ladders, taking huge risks... When he is, it was doing a flying maneuver and gets super kicked straight in the face, which looked like it absolutely killed in that match from Raw like a number of years back. And yet, they push Brock Lesnar, a guy who also sucks on the mic, and yet he became WWE Champion in less than five months. You know, where's the logic there? You know, that, that's where I don't get WWE and in, in, in their logic on things. Because Brock Lesnar was, like, one of the most hottest tickets during that time when it came to SmackDown. He, he, was, he was one of the most popular guys on there. And they were just like, oh, no, you know, we can't do the same thing with Shelton Benjamin. See, that was one of the problems with the Ruthless Aggression Era. And why I think the Ruthless Aggression Era was a colossal failure was because they, they didn't push half the good guys that they had. You know, another underutilized talent, I'd like to go and say, when it comes to the WWE side of things, and I'll probably switch it up a little bit here, but uh, one more from WWE would be from the Nowaday era, whatever you want to call it. I mean, from both the uh, Universe era and I guess now the, uh, the Reality era would be Tyson Kidd. And here's why I say Tyson Kidd. And, I'm, I, I, and maybe a lot of you don't know this about me, but... I'm a huge supporter of Tyson Kidd. I'm going to be watching his match with Adrian Neville for the NXT Championship. I have the network. I'm going to be watching it. The simple fact is, this guy has everything that you would want in a WWE performer. He has the athletic presence. This guy has the body for it. He's in between the build the WWE wants, and the build of an indie wrestler. That's how good this guy is. That's how even this guy is. He can do high-flying moves. He can do technical moves. This guy is the total freaking package. And yet, they, they just... They never utilize him. They, they, they just kind of... They put him back into the developmental side of things when it came to NXT. And I don't understand. I don't understand that. I really don't. You know, the, the fact that Natalia also is now being brought in for the uh, for the developmental side of things for the NXT Women's Championship. You know, uh, both of these both of these guys should be getting huge pushes right now. Natalia to the Divas Championship over on Raw in like a feud with Paige or something. And Tyson Kidd should be along the lines of maybe facing facing Daniel Bryan. So uh, like as if Daniel Bryan gives a guy a second chance that he got. You know it, it doesn't make sense to me. You know and, and it's like oh this guy is not over with the fans. That's because WWE has never given him a chance. We've seen this time and time again with CM Punk. We've seen this time and time again with Daniel Bryan and how they were trying to hold him down. It, it, we see it the same time and time again when it comes to Evan Bourne. You know what I mean? Like, they, they were holding these guys down. You know, they, they could have had different gimmicks. They could have had these different ideas placed for them. And they, and there were so many that fans thought of, and they never capitalized on them. And it's the same thing with Tyson Kidd. I mean, Tyson Kidd has everything that you would want in an athlete, and they just say, screw him. You know, and I get that you have a large roster right now when it comes to the main roster, but you could definitely find something for Tyson Kidd. Like, the guy's no slouch. Well, like, wasn't it not too long ago, like maybe a couple of years ago, when he was a part of Money in the Bank for the SmackDown side of things, for the World Heavyweight Title contract? I'm pretty sure he was. Like, and and nobody thought that he would he would win. Nobody thought that he would win. And he won against Tenzai of all people, like a huge dude, 300 pounds, and he beat him. You know, nobody expected that. They expected if he was going to be in it and Tyson Kidd was going to be in it. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, I was, I was right. Uh, Tenzai was still ended up being in it. I'm sorry. 
He he beat somebody else that was big. I forget who that was, but you know it, it sends me. You know the, the the kid should get a push. Again, the guy has awesome mic skills too. If anybody's heard him talk on NXT, uh, the, the final week before NXT Takeover, I mean that promo between him and and freaking like Tyson Kidd poured his heart out on that mic, man. I mean he he's not your he's not your best mic talker, but he's a pretty damn good mic talker. This guy should be pushed. There's no denying it. This guy should be a top star already. Should have been a top star two years ago. And this is long overdue at this point, in my opinion. Um, another guy, obviously, that's underutilized, and, and rightfully so at this point. Just, I mean, it's without saying. I mean, right now, when it comes to TNA... Even though they're released... I have to say Kaz and Daniels, and I'm not just saying as a tag team. I'm talking about as individuals, man. These guys have everything. They had everything going for them. And this is one of the reasons why I freaking hate TNA sometimes. These guys were so underutilized. Not even funny. Before they were brought in as a tag team, even. These guys had numerous times where they were red hot and they should have gotten the world heavyweight title. And they dropped the ball on them every single time. And it's bullshit because they've been with the company for 10 freaking years, just as long as AJ Styles has. You know, and they, they, they just treated them like they were nothing. Like, there were no Samoa Joe. Like, there were no AJ Styles. Like, there were no Jeff Hardy. Like, there were n there were none of these big TNA stars. I mean, come on. Are you kidding me? Daniels and Kaz as a tag team, is especially though, you know, just underutilized. Especially during, the, uh, during lately. We all wanted bad influence on the American Wolves. We all wanted this. They just freaking dropped the ball on it. Because... They feel like, okay, well, we don't have anything really for them anyway, so why don't we just use them at Valfour Glory and then, then they can be just jobbers until their contract is up. What? Bitch, please. These guys were two-time tag team champions. These were one of the most freaking charismatic teams that you could think of. Would do stupid stuff, but made it work. And they just freaking drop the ball on them every single time and it made no sense to me other other underrated guys um when it comes to the WCW side of things maybe I can go I can go into that I think one of the biggest names when it comes to WCW when he was brought in after the Montreal screw job was burnt hard like you want to look at the definition of underutilized when it comes to a WCW dictionary? Bret Hart's picture would be next to that. This guy had an Iron Man match over in WWE with Shawn Michaels, an hour lawn that had to go into overtime, pulled on a picture-perfect match, and you can't do anything with this guy? That doesn't make any sense to me. You could have done so much with Bret Hart. Bret Hart said himself that it was the first time in his career that he competed in mediocrity. You could have done so much with him in Benoit. You could have done so much with him in Eddie. You could have done so much with him in Mysterio. Like One of his main dreams was to wrestle against Mysterio. And I just... Didn't do any of it. Just, I didn't even far go as far as to say that he was kind of just your main event jobber. Like, how do you job a guy out like that? This guy was the most technically sound athlete that you could pick up. You know that 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 was one of the biggest mistakes that WCW made, especially when they just. Kind of job out to Goldberg like that, even though Goldberg was an absolute beast. 
You know, I loved Goldberg, but it, it was just poor Brett, man. You know. And then, I, I mean, I guess from other from other side of things, I, I mean, I, I guess I could say in ECW he wasn't underutilized, but when he came out of the WWE, absolutely Taz, absolutely underutilized, and people were like, "Oh, Taz sucked." Uh, no, he didn't. Uh, his first match was against Kurt Angle, and it was fucking phenomenal. And it was like, oh, well, WWE didn't want to use him because of his size uh, against Kurt Angle because nobody would believe that, uh, you know, a guy like him could wrestle against a guy like him. One, you'd be fucking surprised. And two, who cares about the height difference? When people heard that Taz was coming out to fight Kurt Angle at Royal Rumble of 2000, nobody gave a crap. They were excited for this match. Taz and Angle tore it off. In Madison Square Garden. They tore it up. They had such a good match, in my opinion. The crowd was into it. I thought it was I thought it was phenomenal. And then there was the last great match Taz had, and he didn't do anything since. We talked about a fuck up, you know what I mean? Like they could have at least put this guy in the mid card or something to win the intercontinental title or something. Like this was just What the hell? You know what I mean? And then, um, after that, I mean, I don't even know, I don't even know where to go to on this, but I mean, it, this, this just got, you know, ridiculous when it came to Taz's push. I mean, he was I, I'd go as to say as he wasn't even pushed, and then he was dropped down to a fucking commentator, you know what I mean? And, granted, he, him and, him and Michael Cole, surprisingly, were a great team. It doesn't matter... It doesn't matter if you love Michael Cole or you hate Michael Cole. For for whatever reason, Michael Cole and Taz was one of the most iconic announced teams in, in, in WWE history. And, I mean, I guess Taz in that aspect wasn't underutilized that way. But, I mean, wrestling-wise, I mean, match-wise, where he could have been pushed with his catchphrase that he had in the ECW. I mean, this guy could have had such a great future ahead of him. Um... And then, I, I, I don't know, I mean, other, uh, there's so many others. I mean, Drew McIntyre, and I know a lot of people say, McIntyre, the guy's a jobber now, he should be a jobber. No, he shouldn't. And let me tell you why. This is where a time where I thought that Drew McIntyre could have had something going here. If they needed to be a faction, this should have been a faction. Wade Barrett... Sheamus and Drew McIntyre as the United Nations. Royal Rumble of 2011, these guys teamed up. Okay? And this was when Wade Barrett was a part of the core, and they worked so damn well together. They should have been a faction. This probably would have been a great faction, and they just did not capitalize on it. I sp and... Not just that. I mean, look at Drew McIntyre's singles run. I mean, this guy was a beast. He was a freaking beast, dude. Like, he knew how to take out an opponent. He knew how to get you to hate you. And he, he was just an all-out great guy that you would just love to hate. And WWE was originally going to do something with him, and then politics got in the fucking way again. And I guess it was over uh, an incident with Tiffany... Something at the time. I, I forget the chick's last name. I think I think it's the Taryn Terrell that he had a freaking issue with. Uh, he, she was Tiffany. She was known as Tiffany at the time. She just got over being ECW general manager uh, around 2010. And it just freaking did not capitalize on a Drew McIntyre push because of goddamn politics. I hate politics and wrestling. I, I think they're stupid. But, you know, he could have had a great future out of them. Um, obviously the other guys, Chris Hero, I mean Cassius Ono when it came to WWE. This guy had everything going for him, and you fucking didn't even put him in, especially to team him up with Antonio Cesaro. What the fuck? Come on. And, and, and you know what it was, too? is because he didn't have the physique 
The guy didn't need it. This guy is an all-around performer all over the world. Are you freaking kidding me? This guy needs a physique to show off what he can do. This guy's a badass. Okay, this guy can cut a promo on like anything I've ever seen, especially in the Ring of Honor days. This guy can wrestle like nobody's business. He can do so many good moves. He can counteract so well with another opponent. This guy was, as far as I'm concerned, even better than CM Punk was. And they could have done so much with him. And they, they dropped the ball with him and just released him from his developmental contract. I thought that was freaking stupid. The fact that he never got to make it to the main stage because of stupid freaking politics. Again, you know, it, it, I hate politics when it holds back a really good athlete. Um, at this point, I'm going to say it, and I don't think people really put this on their list Scott Hall was absolutely underrated. And here's the reason why, okay? WWE, they were going with the new generation, right? So, Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels, and Razor. It's even in the 2K14 video game that they show all three of those guys, along with Yokozuna. Well, explain to me this, then. Why the hell isn't freaking Scott Hall during this time at least a one-time WWF champion? This guy was a destroyer. This guy knew how to get the fans to love him, even though when he wasn't trying. This guy had so many great matches with Shawn Michaels, Bret Hart. Hell, even he may even make Kevin Nash look good. And they dropped the ball with him. Why does he need to win the Intercontinental Champion four times? Although that's a great feat. He should have been along the lines of a Bret Hart or, you know, a sh or you know, fighting Steve Austin or something. Like they, they didn't even they didn't even think of doing that. They didn't even care. You know, I, I think that Scott Hall should have won the world title, and and the same goes with this WCW run. Like, there were numerous times where I thought that Scott Hall should have been a world champion, especially when it came to Kevin Nash. Okay, Kevin Nash hogged the fucking spotlight, especially away from Kevin Nash. Okay, Scott Hall should have been the one to win the championship from Goldberg. Here's why, okay. One, both of them are freaking absolute destroyers in that ring. Destroyers, okay. The simple fact that we can't even get Scott Hall... And Goldberg, which in my opinion is a freaking dream match for the world heavyweight title, is an absolute travesty. It is one of the biggest travesties that WCW never picked up on. No, instead they pick Kevin fucking Nash, who has about as much talent as a mouse running on a wheel for wrestling ability. Okay? He, he's not that talented. He's boring, he's dull, he's bland if you watch him, and you feel like you've watched him for six hours. If you put Goldberg and freaking Scott Hall in that ring, I guarantee you those two would have freaking tore each other apart. And with a world title on the line, it would have just amped up the stakes. No disqualification? I think hell yes. Especially if those two motherfuckers are in that ring, it would have been more ten times brutal than if it was just a regular match. But, never capitalize on it because Kevin Nash is a dick and decided to... Fuck with Bischoff, and now we know Bischoff as what he is, is not a genius. Because he decided to put Kevin Nash in charge of booking, so Kevin Nash booked himself to being the World Heavyweight Champion. You know, because that makes sense. You know, and again, you know, Kevin uh, Scott Hall had so much potential during WWE and WCW. In, in the 1990s, this guy should have been on top, and they just... 
Never did anything with him. They never did anything. They they just stuck him as the third wheel of the NWO. Like the main stars were Kevin Nash and Hulk Hogan. Never about Scott Hall. Scott Hall was just the the, the man on the waist side. You know, it, it, it's it's just sad to really you know think about it like that, but it's true. It really is true. Um, other underrated superstars, and I, I mean, we've been going on this list for 25 minutes. I'm probably going only, only going to go with a couple more. I'm going to go with Ring of Honor side of things. Um, because I'm, I'm, I, and only Ring of Honor. Because I don't really want to go into, you know, the, uh, the TNA side of things. Because right now he's actually in a pretty good spot in TNA because he's actually getting shown on TV. But, I mean, Kenny King, I don't know, maybe uh, maybe he'll it'll still be, eventually he'll also probably be underutilized. I mean, let's face it, it's the TNA. But, I mean, this guy was an incredible, and still is an incredible athlete. And is the Shelter Benjamin with microphone steroids, okay? This guy has charisma on, to him like, on, like anything I've ever seen. And... The, the, the Ring of Honor just sticks him in the tag team division. I mean, that's all they did with the guy. They didn't do anything with him when it came into a singles match, unless it was like once in a blue moon. And the guy, every time he was in a singles match, a Ring of Honor would freaking deliver. And they just never capitalized on what he can do as a singles guy. They always stuck him in the fucking tag team division. And I don't understand what what the purpose of that was. I, I honestly think it, all it did was just hold him back from from the big talent and the big household name he could have been in Ring of Honor. And I think that's the truth. I think that's the absolute truth. And it still is, probably, in TNA. Because, I mean, he was a singles guy for a little bit, and he was one of the a, a really good X Division champion. Especially when he was feuding with Saban, that 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 was a really good storyline built up by TNA. Only one of the very few uh, during that time period, especially with the Aces and Aids crap going on. Um, and y you know now he's stuck in a tag team with not only Bobby Lashley, which honestly, I mean, I, I, again, I have no problem with it. I always thought that Lashley and Kenny King should team up anyway, but you know. Then they teamed up in a faction with MVP. So what? We get Negolution? That's basically what this is. This is a black version of Evolution. Like, if you... I don't know if it was intentional or not. I, I, I'm, I'm assuming it's not because I don't think they thought of it before. I'm like, I don't, I don't think they went into WWE. Like, because I know they're Tate. And I know that... Um, you know, TNA uh, only uh, can only go so many weeks because I, I know they tape, like, a lot of their shows. So I don't know if they, you know, plan to rip off WWE or not. But the bottom line is it's just, it's bullshit. You know, it, 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 this shouldn't even be a faction. They should just be thriving on their own as single stars. I mean, it, it, mainly Kenny King. I don't think Lashley, I think Lashley's overdue anyway. But... You know, Kenny King. You know, Lashley's overrated. Kenny King is the underrated one here in this situation. MVP has had his time to shine. You know, it, it's time for Kenny King to get his spot. And, I mean, with, with that being said, uh, you know, I guess one more guy. I have to go with Jay Lethal on this. And I'm talking about later on in TNA. I'm not talking about uh, when he was Black Machine's mode, because that gimmick was just awesome. Um, but he was so underrated in 2010, like it wasn't even funny. And this guy had some of the greatest, and I do mean greatest, work with Ric Flair. And I mean, the, the, he had great promos. And great matches with with members of the Fortune Four, and he had so much charisma, and he could hang with Ric Flair on the mic. 
he could do stuff and make a memorable moment for TNA history. That is something that is unheard of. That was one of the promos that I wanted to put in, but I, I, I could not fit it in. It was just... It was awesome. You know, that, that's one of the greatest moments in TNA history was that Ric Flair and Jay Lethal promo and how they fought off and they were like... Jay Lethal was imitating Ric Flair and Ric Flair was getting all freaking pissed off and sweaty and shit. Like, and then they were trying to one-up each other when it came to the styling and profiling gimmick that Ric Flair always does and Jay Lethal was trying to mimic him. It, it was just one of the greatest TNA moments ever. And it led to a great match between Desmond Wolfe and Jay Lethal. And I felt like this guy should already be world champion just from this fucking promo alone. This guy shouldn't, it, this shouldn't even be a question. This guy should already be launched at the top. He has the X, he, he has the X Division Championship. This guy should be pushed now. Like, this guy should be pushed absolutely now. And, you know, I, I, I really think it should happen. I really think at this point it should happen. But, TNA released them. And I just never capitalized on him. And, hell, I'll, I'll even go with one more African-American superstar I, when it comes to TNA. D'Angelo De Niro. No, 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 actually, not even just in, in TNA. In WWE, because if, if people remember, he was in WWE as Elijah Burke. This guy in both companies had great potential to be a huge star in both organizations. And they dropped the ball with him numerous times. And this guy had... All the talent in the world to have a great feud with numerous people. And he screwed up and dropped the ball every time. All the time. One of TNA's biggest freaking problems is they dropped the ball. I think that will do it for that segment. Um, I'm going to go one more segment. And then we're probably going to end it from here at the uh, maybe the 40, 45 minute mark. Um, I figured I might as well go over, um, what I think of the WWE Network. Okay, I think this network is genius. The fact that Vince McMahon has come up with the biggest grand idea that he's ever made in his life and has killed piracy and by rates doing it. Like, he has literally crushed those two things. They don't exist. They don't freaking exist. And if you don't have the WWE Network, get it. Because it is must-have for any wrestling fan. Um, it, it is just... It's awesome to look at all the live... Like, all the stuff that they have in the library. I mean, they have all pay-per-views from all different organizations that WWE owns under the name when it comes to WWE, WCW, and ECW. I think they also have AWA and, like, numerous other organizations. And it's just a great selection. They also have WWE documentaries, WCW documentaries on there, uh, like the, like w, like DVDs on the actual network. They also have freaking so much other stuff, and 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 they also have Warrior Week matches on there. I think they also have Legends House. That's like one of their most popular show, which from what I hear is hilarious. I still have yet to check it out. Um, because, you know, I, I can't just watch WWE Network all night. I mean, have a life. But, um, you know, I, I hear it's such a great selection of what you can get on there. Um, you know, and I, I've seen it. I, I, I love the Raw pre-shows. I love the uh, pay-per-view post-shows. I haven't checked out the Raw post-show yet. I'm, I'm definitely going to be doing that this week because I don't have school anymore. Uh, Tuesday's my last day. Um, so I'll be able to check out the pre-shows, uh, for all that stuff. But, um, you know, it, it, it's just gonna be so good. It, it, it's gonna be so good to check out all the stuff that they have. You gotta have the WWE Network. Ten, ten dollars a month for all of this stuff. It, it's gonna be insane. It's gonna be insane. And, and, and they're gonna have more good matches now just because they have this network and they want people to keep their subscription. So... That's a great thing. Um, that will about do it. I'm not really going to do so much with this. I, I figured I'd keep it like under one topic or two topics. Just because I feel like it's a better podcast if I do it that way. 
if I come up with like something, maybe like a raw review show after this, like for the Jay Hebert side of things, I'll probably do it. But until then, this is the Jay Hebert side of things, and this has been Jay Hebert giving his side of things. Peace out, guys.